So I'm going to start really a global look. Global energy outlook is, is terrific, that we continue to see global demand increase, and actually in the last couple of years, um, we've seen some of the fastest increases in global demand that we've ever seen. Uh, International Energy Agency has the global demand picture growing each and every year out to the end of their forecast. Uh, natural gas growing faster than any other energy source. Crude oil growing fairly substantially as well. Um, that's, that's great, and Canada is well positioned. We have the world's third largest crude oil resources. We have the world's sixth largest supplier of natural gas. If we look at uh, that demand, this year Ipsos Reid went out to 31 countries and asked, you know, where would you like to get your energy from, your oil and gas? And 31 countries picked Canada as their number two choice. In every single country, they want domestic to be first. Everybody wants to produce their own oil and gas. But if we can't produce it all ourselves, uh, when given a list of the world's top 10 producers, Canada was the number one choice. They think, for whatever reason, we're reliable, we're safe, environmentally high standards. All that basket of goods leaves the world thinking we're a pretty great place. Um, when we look at global investment in oil and gas, um, we have seen prices drop fairly substantially in 2014 through 15, uh, but they've now stabilized here in 2017 and coming into 2018 at that mid-60 range. Uh, global investment has increased over the last couple of years. This year actually got a substantial increase between five and nine percent increase in global oil and gas investment. Um, the challenge is though that Canada's on the outside of that. We're actually going to see another decrease this year in capital investment. We're going to decrease by about 1% to $43 billion roughly. That's down substantially from the 24 number, which was a high water mark at $81 billion. And uh, we've been right around that $44, $43 billion for the last couple of years. So we're not seeing the, gro the, you know, the growth is happening in the world of production in investment in oil and gas. Uh, we're just struggling to see it uh, here and to maintain what we have. Um, to exacerbate on that, uh, the, the challenges aren't equal in Canada. That uh, Some of the bigger challenges is oil sands. That In 2014, we were investing $34 billion in oil sands. This year, it's going to be less than $15 billion. And uh, the difference between 2014 and certainly before that is, historically, these billion dollars that we were spending in the oil sands were for growth. Um, we're now at a more mature stage that the oil sands has a lot of sustaining capital. So when I say $14 billion of capital investment in oil sands, two-thirds of that is just sustaining the capital that was invested over the last few years. Only a third of, both of that, roughly, is new capital uh, for, for growth, growing our supply, and uh, allowing us to be that supplier of choice. Um, the effects of the... This has had, this pullback in capital expenditure is, I'm certain, felt by almost everyone in this room, by the businesses, the machine shops, the engineering firms, the, the draftsmen, the hotels and restaurants. Um, I think we need to aspire to attract our proportion of capital investment, if not more, and, uh, and position ourselves for that kind of success. If we look at some of the dynamics of this past year, we saw some of the global companies selling out of some of their assets in Canada, certainly in the oil sands. If we're to follow where those companies reallocated those funds, I think that also tells a story. We used to tell the story that you know Canada was safe and reliable. We used to tell the story that uh, of the free enterprise oil in the world, we had 60% of it, of the investable. Um, we don't talk about that anymore because what we're actually seeing is capital is coming out of Canada and what happened this year. It was reallocated into Iran and Brazil. And people wouldn't put Iran and Brazil at the top of their list because they're democratic or environmental stewards. But these global companies with big portfolios are recognizing today as a better investment than what they had here in Canada. Um, that's a challenge. The other challenge is our largest customer, as uh, Janet referenced, is becoming our largest competitor. The technology has fundamentally changed their energy outlook. and. Uh, <clears throat> they are now actually displacing Canadian gas out of Ontario and Quebec. That historically, 100% of gas in Ontario and Quebec were Canadian. Today, about 50% is actually coming from the Marcellus up and pushing Canadian <coughs> gas out. The lowest cost gas in the world today is in Canada um, because the U.S. is eating up their market. Uh, we have no outlet otherwise, and, uh, and that challenge 
is, is something we really have to face head on. So um, as I was putting my notes together, as we talked about investments and competitiveness and investor confidence and global reputation, what's the alternative? What, uh, where is this today, if we were to follow the money, how could we reposition ourselves? And I, I looked at the last 18 months in the US, which is dramatically increasing its capital expenditure and its production. Um, they've done a few things very deliberately. They have world-class resources. Technology has been fundamental in their energy renaissance, uh, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. The same technology is actually that we use, and we help develop some of it, they help develop some of it. It's being used across the border. They have these shale plays which are massive. Um, we have shale plays that are massive, the Montney, the Duvernay. Um, some that are in the Montney and Duvernay think that they're bigger and more prolific than the Permian. Uh, phenomenal opportunity. But in the US, they've seen this growth over the last few years, but even in the last 18 months, we saw an election where the economic platform of the winning candidate uh, was, we're going to make oil and gas the centerpiece of our economic renewal. And after taking on the responsibility of government, they've, they've gone after it through Mick Mulvaney, who was appointed to the management Office of Management and Budget Office, um, kind of the central clearinghouse of policy and regulations in the states. They sent out a note to all other agencies, identify where there's challenges to oil and gas investment, and come forward with a plan on how you would address that to all their agencies. And uh, I met with Mick Mulvaney and his team here about six months ago, and they were actioning the pieces they got in. Some of the other things I saw is we had the opportunity to meet with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency's president and CEO. And when you walk into their doors in Washington, it's a massive building uh, close to the White House. Over the Obama years, it grew in stature, importance, and budget substantially and in its scope of responsibility fairly dramatically. The mandate under the new administration was to get back to their mandate, that their mandate was very clear and they needed to be exceptional at protecting waterways and, and the pieces, but that they were going to get out of the things largely that weren't within their mandate. And you walk into their lobby and there's sandwich boards um, so that every employee when they come to work sees a sandwich board and it says, the EPA will be getting back to its mandate that this is the expectation. And today when you leave work, you'll see the same billboard. That's the mandate. We are going to make this an efficient regulatory system and leave states to do their piece and, and the federal agencies to do theirs. Um, the Interior Department, same thing. How do you streamline the pipeline process? Well, you get the Interior Department to look at how it currently works and come up with a more streamlined approach, and it's working. Um, if we look at Canada over the last 18 months, it's a challenging record, and one that I don't necessarily even want to confront, but today we have between 40 and 50 regulatory, legislative, and uh, policy issues that we're working with with multiple different governments, like a substantial number of, of important issues that will have an effect on our competitiveness, on, on how we do our business and how we can compete. Um, we have, if we look at the projects over the last 18 months that Billions of dollars have gone into developing them and moving them forward. The last 18 months has been terrible. We saw Northern Gateway canceled after it was approved. We saw Energy East canceled. We saw the Pacific Northwest LNG facility canceled uh, just before its final investment decision. The Nexon LNG facility, again, canceled. That's been our track record. We do have Kinder Morgan, which has been approved, and Kinder Morgan's working very hard to get that to success. But, uh, you know, I'll, we'll certainly be commenting on it here a little bit later. Not a clear path. We're not sending a consistent, strong message to the world that Canada can get things done. In fact, the reputation that too often precedes us is Canada's a place that can't get things done. And uh, we need to take that on um, fully. We need to own it. And, uh, and if we don't, we, I think, are, are going to be looking at lower investment numbers, lower jobs into the future. Um, as so there was a couple things uh, that's kind of the global picture I thought if I had this crowd of, of business leaders I don't want to talk about all 40 I don't want to talk about uh, you know a broad spectrum but I thought there's about four things that are moving today that uh, we expect to see policy announcements in the next weeks or months 
and I want to put on your radar and just let you know a quick update on them. Um, the first is the market access. The federal government over the last couple of years, certainly over the last year, had a large process looking at the National Energy Board Act and the SIA Environmental Assessment Act. We expect to see that tabled in the Parliament in the next couple of days. So that's something we're watching very closely. And I won't get into too many comments here because I think we'll talk about it in detail, about uh, Kinder Morgan and the challenges that the British Columbia government has put forward and the response from, from Alberta. But when we look at that, the, the, the solution that we continue to reaffirm is it's got its approval, it's got its support, uh, it's got 150 conditions, and the Oceans Protection Plan is in place that British Columbia doesn't have a role here. That they have a role to engage with their citizens, they have a role to, uh, to ensure that there's environmental protections on, on their responsibilities, but on national and international pipelines and energy projects. The federal government has a very robust an important uh, process that it has to go through, and Kinder Morgan has. I want to talk about methane. Uh, that's the second one I want to put on people's radar. That uh, Canada and the U.S. actually partnered on a very uh, ambitious and aggressive target, a 45% reduction of methane emissions. Um, we think that's doable. We thought it was important that we partner with the U.S. because that's who we're competing with for capital. And if we go forward jointly, um, it, it allows us to be, to be very ambitious. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. has changed direction on this and said, in fact, they aren't going to move forward with a 45% reduction. Um, Canada's made the choice that we are. Uh, we're going to go it alone. And uh, that's federal and provincial governments. So with that as a reality, we as an industry said this is doable. It's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but if we do this the most efficient way possible, that it would be the most responsible way. So late last year, we brought forward a plan to government about how to do this. And it still will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. It still will likely cost about 7,000 jobs, even if we do it uh, the most efficient way possible. But um, there are activist groups that are pushing very different plans that could have substantially higher costs. And we're working with government on this. And uh, they've taken our data and, and are working it through. But we expect to see that in the next uh, the next few weeks, possibly months. Something you may hear on that, and you know, methane is one of those existential issues. It will be extremely impactful. But what you'll hear from some of the the activist groups is that, well, at the state level, yes, the federal government in the U.S. has pulled back, but at the state level, that they're taking on the 45% reduction. Um, we've looked into that, and some states are. Unfortunately, they're not the oil producing states. It's not Texas, it's not Oklahoma. Um, some that are more minor gas producers are, but where we're really attracting capital from is, is not. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying if that is our goal, let's do it in the most efficient way possible. That's, uh, that's uh, gonna be our approach. Uh, the last detail or thing I would like to put on people's radar is the, the OBA plan, the Carbon Competitiveness Initiative that the government brought forward in December, um, that is the replacement of the ESCR program. So how the carbon um, pricing is, um, is uh, implemented on large emitters. When it came out, um, we had some serious concerns and we wrote an opinion editorial, and my comments today are really consistent with the opinion editorial because we want to work with government on this. But uh, at that time, we threw a, a yellow flag on the field to say, this here will be substantial cost to our industry, one costs that aren't being seen in other places. And the structure of it uh, is going to challenge some of our, our communities, that uh, the structure of this plan potentially could have the effect of making it more difficult to share technologies. We've spent a decade breaking down barriers between companies so we get the best performance out of everybody, that we raise all boats, um, a t rising tide rises all boats, where this would leave an incentive to not share your best technology because in fact you may want to keep it and if your neighbor has a poorer performance, there would be an economic incentive for you. One of the other challenges was that it doesn't recognize differences in geology or regions, that uh, this potentially will hit not just company against company, but community against community. And uh, that that's not a, a good way to, 
to put forward a policy that ultimately we want to see reducing our impacts on the environment, reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. Let's, let's work together to find a solution that uh, positions Alberta as a leader, which um, we most certainly are, in, in a way that doesn't uh, have those negative consequences. So I'm going to conclude my comments there with those uh, four things on your radar.